red machine was rocking. The best team in baseball, some experts call them. Suddenly, they have sputtered to the brink of elimination. Some teams are done in by poor execution. Others by bad luck. The Reds have had both. It's been one of those dark weeks where every move is anticipated, every rally thwarted, every confrontation lost. A young Red star continues to live in a nightmare while a Braves rookie hero shines in the moment. In game three, Atlanta's power came from an unlikely outlet, getting a bonus three-run charge from the forgotten end of the battery. Now, Bobby Cox and the Braves are just one game from a third World Series. The only unfinished business is to get a former ace back on track and try to author another chapter looking for the storybook ending that has eluded them throughout this decade. On a dark and cloudy Saturday evening in Atlanta, it is darkest and cloudiest for the Cincinnati Reds, who find themselves down three games to none in the National League Championship Series. Game four coming up between the Reds and the Braves. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Atlanta. Along with Joe Morgan, I'm Greg Gumbel. Every single cliche you can think of, do or die, got to give 110%, backs against the wall, they all apply to the Cincinnati Reds who need a win here tonight to continue play in the NLCS. One lineup change for the Atlanta Braves tonight. Right fielder David Justice hit in the knee by a batting practice a batted ball, and he is out of the game. Mike Devereaux replaces him. It's a nice luxury for Bobby Cox to be able to sit him tonight, and also he has a nice luxury in his rotation. Well, I think that's the key, the luxury in his rotation. Starting Steve Avery tonight allows him to give the other three starters their normal day's rest, and he knows that they cannot lose three in a row if his starters have adequate rest. So Steve Avery is the guy tonight. Maybe they won't need the other starters, but they're starting to fix their rotation for the World Series right now. In 30 innings in this series so far, the Reds have managed just five runs. The key moment last night came with Greg Maddox pitching in the third inning to Reggie Sanders. Well, he was struggling early. Now, watch this sequence. Seven fastballs and two change-up. This kind of shows you what the Reds have gone through. Reggie Sanders really battles here. The Reds have battled, but they have always ended up losing. And Maddox comes out on top in this confrontation. And this was the ball game because after this inning, Maddox started to roll. Now, here's the high fastball that they have used to the entire series to take Sanders out, and that's the problem. All right, Joe, how do the Reds feel about things coming in tonight? Let's go downstairs and check with Johnny Bench. John. Well, Greg, uh, David Johnson wants them to have fun, be aggressive, and the one thing he told them in the meeting was, look, we faced a lot of adversity. I've faced a lot of adversity. No team has come back from being down three games. Why not us be the one? And of course, the Cincinnati Reds have to do it against the Atlanta Braves. No easy task, Greg. Johnny Avery against Shurik. Battle of left-handers tonight. Will the Braves have a sweep or will the Reds live to fight another day? We'll get started right after we check in with Hannah Storm. I'm Hannah Storm. Welcome to Game 4 of the League Championship Series. While you watch the Reds try to stay alive in Atlanta, the Indians look to even their series with Seattle. Last night, it was Jay Buhner's 11th inning heroics that gave the surprising Mariners a 5-2 victory and put Seattle up two games to one in the series. Earlier, bad news for the Indians. In the ninth, Albert Bell injured his right foot and ankle when he was hit by a Norm Charlton pitch. He is on crutches and available only to pinch hit if necessary tonight. And so the burden a little bit heavier on Eddie Murray, who is struggling in the cleanup spot. In three games, he's gone just two for 14 and stranded 10 runners. The Indians send former National Leaguer Ken Hill to the mound to make his first start of the postseason. He did win a game in relief in the division series. And the Mariners as well start a former National Leaguer, Andy Bennis. Bennis has split his first two playoff appearances. We'll keep you updated on all of the action from Jacobs Field, and we'll get you back for the first pitch in Atlanta after this from your local station. Tonight in leading off, Barry Larkin hits second and plays short. Ron Gant in the number three spot. Reggie Sanders in a horrible slump, hitting cleanup and playing right field. Mariano Duncan replaces Hal Morris at first base and hits fifth. Benito Santiago is behind the plate. Brett Boone is on second base and he'll bat seventh. The number eight hitter is Mark Lewis, who replaces Jeff Branson at third. And the pitcher is game one pitcher Pete Shurek. 
And there is David Justice who will sit out the action tonight. We mentioned the lineup change. He caught a batting practice batted ball on the knee in the same place where he hurt himself exactly one week ago tonight against the Colorado Rockies. This was his second trip to the plate against Colorado and watch the ball off the bat hit the inside of his right knee and Bobby Cox says the ball which hit him in the in in pregame hit him in the exact same spot and again it's fortunate that Bobby Cox can afford to sit him down with a three games to none lead. Jeff. Well you're exactly correct they'll just ice it for the next couple of days and hope that it's OK. But of course if the Braves do not win tonight then they see justice in there tomorrow. David Justice will sit in favor of uh, the right handed hitting Mike Devereaux who will play right field and Steve Avery four years ago the National League Championship Series MVP for the Atlanta Braves getting his first start of this postseason tonight. Well Steve Avery was the guy that most people pointed to and said he was going to be the superstar of this staff. Uh, they felt like he had a little better fastball than the other guys except for Smoltz and he had great stuff and he was young he was just going to get better. He struggled a lot this season the last three starts he made were pretty good. He had a one and oh record with a one point two nine earned run average in his last three starts so they think he's back on track. Basically a fastball and his changeup is his out pitch as well as a curveball but fastball changeup. And let's take a look at the defense now. You see the change in right field. That's Mike Devereaux out there instead of Justice. Grissom, Klesko in left. Chipper Jones at third. Belliard, Lemke, McGriff, and Javier Lopez is back behind the plate tonight. He'll catch Steve Avery. Lopez has not caught Avery very much. In fact, as you saw there, one third of an inning. And out in right field, Mike Devereaux tonight. He played left field here last night. Well, Devereaux is a key guy for them because, especially against the left-handed pitching of Pete Shurik, because Shurik is a very good pitcher and he's very tough on left-handers. The umpires for tonight's game: Jerry Davis is behind the plate, Randy Marsh at first, Jerry Crawford at second, Paul Rungi at third, Jim Quick down the left field line, and Dana Demuth, last night's home plate umpire, is down the right field line. And here's Jerome Walton. Walton, a 290 hitter during the regular season, 0 for 4 in this National League Championship Series as the Cincinnati Reds try to dig themselves out of a 3 0 hole. No team has ever done that before in the postseason. And especially against a staff like the Atlanta Braves have. We're underway. Ball one. Jerome Walton, 290 during the regular season, eight home runs, 22 runs batted in. And the 1989 National League Rookie of the Year when he was a member of the Chicago Cubs. 2-0. If you want to look for a key on Avery tonight to see how well he's faring, it will be his changeup. If he gets the changeup down, then he will be consistent the entire evening. He will be able to handle the right-handed hitters on the Reds. That one misses and he runs a count to three balls and no strikes. Even though he has fallen behind here with three fastballs, his problems this year were not the fastball. He was not getting hurt so much with the fastball, but he was leaving the changeup up, and it was costing him a lot of runs. So the key will be if he keeps his changeup down. Three and one now to Jerome Walton. He'll be followed by Barry Larkin and then Ron Gant. Change makes the count full now three and two. Well, look where this pitch is, and it everything looks the same. The arm speed, everything looks the same, but that is the change of right down where he wants it. He follows it back, and the count remains full at three and two. The Reds have had their chances in this series. They had a chance to win game one. They had a chance to win game two, and they had their opportunities early in the game against Greg Maddox here last night. to be able to throw a 3-1 change or 3-2 change up that really sticks in the hitter's mind now watch there's the target there's the change up way out in front of it 
but the difference in his changeup and others change up is the plane he almost starts at the same spot as he th starts the fastball and you just really cannot tell the difference until it's almost on top of you. Here's Barry Larkin. Ball one to Larkin. And when you talked about the Reds have had chances I think our open summed it up best. They have battled they have fought hard but they seem to lose at every turn and, and that's the problem. And some kind of hitter. We talk about this Atlanta pitching staff and Barry Larkin. This is career against Avery Smoltz, Glavin, and Maddox, 300 or better. Down and in, two balls and a strike. And all these pitchers are similar yet different. Similar in that they all work off of the fastball, but different in that their out pitches and their control is a complete is different for each one. Smoltz can be overpowered. Broken back right back to Avery. Another changeup. How do you break a bat on a changeup? Well, that one hit off the end of the bat. He was so far out in front, he hit it right off the end of the bat. It's a beautiful pitch. I mean, you have to realize that you can't recognize from his arm speed that it's anything other than a fastball, right? See that? Right. right off the end of the bat because he's way out in front. Two up and two gone in the first inning, and here is Ron Gant. Three for 12 in the LCS. A 250 hitter in this LCS, just 240 in the postseason. His bat, one of those conspicuous by its absence. And sometimes when you're, you look at a situation you have to look at it from both sides. Sure the Braves pitchers are maybe they have the best pitching staff in the league and they know how to pitch. But from the other side the hitters on the Reds are so supposed to be some of the best hitters in the league. You have to make adjustments to these pitchers. You have to give something to get something. You have to give up maybe the long ball in order to hit some line drives. And I don't think the Reds have adjusted very well. And that could change tonight. Manager Davey Johnson, he can't change soon enough. 2 1 pitched again. Followed the plate, 2 and 2. See, I mean, that swing right there is indicative of what I'm talking about. Ron Gant is a very good hitter, but that swing was an awkward swing. Now, take a look at this swing. I mean, you can't, what can you do with that? Even if he makes contact, the ball cannot go anyplace. So they're being kept off balance by this Atlanta pitching staff. 2 2 to Gant. That's ball just a little low. Three and two. You're right, Joe. At the middle of that swing, Ron Gant was flat footed. Yeah. Play. I mean, if he hits it, where is it going to go? No place. One of the infielders at best. So the second time, Avery has gone to a full count on a hitter here in the first inning. Strike three call. Two strikeouts in the first for Steve Avery. We'll go to the bottom half of the first scoreless. Walton being struck out with a 3 2 changeup. Everybody on the Reds bench saw that. So when Gant came up in the same situation, unconsciously he's looking for a changeup. What does he get? Fastball for strike three. He wasn't ready for it. All right, Joe, here's tonight's Budweiser starting lineup now for the Atlanta Braves. Looking for the sweep tonight. Marquise Grissom in center. Mark Lemke at second. Chipper Jones at third. Fred McGriff at first. Mike Devereaux replaces David Justice in right. Javi Lopez behind the plate. Ryan Klesko is in left. Rafael Belliard at short. And Steve Avery, the pitcher. They will face game one starter for Cincinnati, Pete Shurick. And Pete Shurick will remind you of the Atlanta Braves pitching staff. Good fastball, great curveball, and a change. If he's getting his curveball over the plate, he can be very tough, and he has been lately. He struck out eight in that game one that he started. Which the uh, Reds eventually lost. Marquise Grissom follows it off. Here's a look at the Cincinnati defense, Chuck. And the only real big change is Duncan at first base and Walton at center field. Gant, Walton, and Sanders in the outfield. Mark Lewis over at third base. Larkin, Boone, Duncan on the infield. Santiago and Shuri. Down the third baseline, backhanded by Mark Lewis across the diamond for the out. As I said, Shurik will remind you a lot of Glavin and a lot 
of Avery. Fastball, see that ball's inside. It looks like it's hit hard. It really isn't. The reason it's a tough play is because Lewis is playing in tight, guarding against the bunt. He made a good pitch. He jammed him, and he just hit it in the right spot. So he has plenty of time to move for that ball right there. But it was a good pitch by Shurik. Nice play by Lewis. Here's Mark Lemke. Gets the first pitch deep in the hole. Larkin will have to hurry. Got it. Good play by Barry Larkin for the second out of the inning. This 1995 League Championship Series game is brought to you by Buick and your local Buick dealers. Remember Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. By Burger King, where you can get your burgers worth. And Network MCI, how to get modern communications technology working for your business. Here's Chipper Jones. The rookie three out of ten in the LCS. And a two-run homer here last night from the left side of the plate. It's interesting you made your point in the open. The difference between Chipper Jones as a rookie having a great series and Reggie Sanders. I mean, just two contrasting styles there. A rookie in his first playoff, and he's doing great. Veteran not doing so well. Cincinnati or in the Atlanta dugout Chipper went by and he said hi and John Smoltz <laughs> happened to say that's the most I've heard him say in a long time. <laughs> Big swing and a miss two and two. See there's the same type of pitch the change up away to Chipper Jones. You will see a lot of similarities between these two pitchers tonight. Good fastballs good change ups but Shurik has the better curveball of the two. So a strikeout for Shurik. He gets a couple of good plays in the field, including this one from Barry Larkin. We've played one here in Atlanta. Reds trying to stay alive tonight. We have no score after one. <laughs> On display as we go to the top of the second inning here in Atlanta. Reggie Sanders, Mariano Duncan, and Benito Santiago to face Steve Avery. And Reggie Sanders, a man with a problem, just looking for a way to get a base hit. He is two out of 13 in the LCS. Eight strikeouts. He struck out 13 of the last 18 times he's been to the plate. Ball one. And immediately even, even Avery's going to throw him the high fastball. There's another high fastball. This, this could be a good situation for Sanders, though, because Avery's changeup may not bother him nearly as much as Maddox's changeup did. If they throw him there. Yes. Now he's getting <laughs> fastballs. One and two. The high fastball has been his downfall in this series. And here it is again. The first two pitches. High fastball. Even this one they wanted inside more was out over the plate. And he usually handles the one out over the plate pretty well. That one was in. They wanted it in and they didn't get it in. One two to Sanders. Two and two. Well, you have to wonder at what point does it become mental, Joe? Well, I think it's already mental. You're right. I, I think it became mental after the middle of the second game. From that point on, I think it's been mental for him. All three. Sanders is on and with Mariano Duncan coming up to the plate. Let's check in with Hannah Storm. Hannah. Greg, the Indians are on the board already. Kenny Lofton, after leading off with a line drive single off Andy Bennis, steals second. Catcher Dan Wilson's throw is off and Lofton, the stolen base leader in the American League, goes to third on the error and then later he scores on a Carlos Baerga ground out. So the Indians have a 1-0 lead. Greg and Joe. All right, Hannah, thanks. We're scoreless in the top of the second. The Reds with their first base runner of the night, Reggie Sanders at first. Avery, of course, has a good pickoff move. He picked off 13 runners this year, but he also allowed 30 stolen bases. 
and they only threw out two runners at second base. So what that means is if you don't get picked off, you have a good chance to steal. <laughs> there is techno fan down there. <laughs> to remember with a left-handed pitcher when his right leg if his right leg goes behind the rubber he has to go to the plate if his right foot goes behind the rubber he automatically has to go to the plate or it's a ball that's one of the rate ways you can read her left hand on the ground little play ball Jones to Lemke to Griff two out and nobody out and once again in a storm well, Greg, the Indians are just jumping all over Mariners starter Andy Bennis. Eddie Murray at the plate, just two for 14 in the series before this at bat, and it's gone. A two run home run for Murray, his first RBI of the series. Now the Indians have a 3 0 lead over Seattle. Greg? Well, I don't think any of us expected the Indians to go quietly no. into the night. Oh, you made the point yesterday that they're not going to quit. <laughs> was an original thought too. Joe. Yes. You know that? <laughs> They're a good team. <laughs> Santiago on the big breaking ball. Strike one. See Santiago's numbers for the NLCS. Five of 19 in the postseason. Including the series against the Colorado Rockies. And he calls time at the plate as Avery was on the kick. Sellout crowd here in Atlanta, 52,067. Bounced at the plate, one and one. Santiago is also a key for the Reds. We talk about Sanders and Gant, but I think Santiago is a guy that can really help them too if he gets hot. Lined in the right field, and that will fall in front of Mike Devereaux for the first hit of the night. And he's the kind of guy that can handle left handed pitching because he will go the other way. The last few days he's been trying to pull everything, but that's a good sign right there. He just takes the fastball and lines it to right field. So Santiago is on at first with two outs, second base runner of the inning, and here's Brett Boone. Three out of 11, Boone has also scored a run. Walked once and struck out twice. From Steve Avery with the terrific pickoff move, but also the fact that they run on him an awful lot and successfully. Fastball. One and one. Well, he's changing his motion. He will use a slide step, which means he doesn't pick his right leg up very high, and then he picks it up and goes back, and he picks it up and throws to first base. That variation will keep a lot of base runners guessing. First. Steve Avery with his ability to keep the runners on. And they take off. Well, there's the 30, and only two, two caught at second base. In the air, short left center field. Cusco is there. And the Reds leave a runner stranded here in the top of the second. We'll go to the last half of the second. The Reds nothing. The Braves nothing. Welcome back to Atlanta as we go to the bottom of the second inning. Take a look at the numbers. Talk about frustration in the Cincinnati dugout. Missed opportunities galore, Joe. Well, I, for me, it's, it's a matter of fact that the Reds are just not handling this pitching staff well. The Braves do not make a lot of mistakes under pressure with men on base, and the Reds are basically the middle of the lineup of mistake hitters. You know, John may have a different slant on that. Johnny, as you look at those numbers, not hard to understand why the Reds are down 0-3. I know one thing, the uh, scouting uh, department has to get an extra bonus at Christmas. This is unbelievable. I mean, that's that's unfathomable. A ball club like the Reds, as well as they hit all year long, can go into a series and put up those kind of numbers. And a lot of it has to do with scouting reports, plus the fact that they have not been able to swing the bats in the situations. It's, I mean, it's got to be the most miserable time for the Reds right now you've ever seen. 
Here's Fred McGriff. Thank you, John. McGriff, Devereaux, and Javi Lopez to face Pete Shorick here in the second inning. Here's a call strike. You know, the Reds have suffered an incredible power shortage, too. They have not had a home run in, in this series. They didn't go four straight games during the regular season without hitting a home run. Their last home run was Mark Lewis's in the clincher against the Dodgers. Very difficult to drive the ball, Greg, when you're off balance. And they're being kept off balance with the change-ups and the fastballs up and out of the strike zone. The off-speed pitchers are making the Reds singles hitters rather than power hitters. And not very many singles I was, <laughs> yeah, when they do that. But again, the middle of the lineup are basically guys that they handle. If you make a mistake, they hit the ball out of the ballpark. The, the Braves pitchers are not making mistakes. McGriff pulls off two and one. In fact, I, I, I was thinking before the game yesterday that this Braves pitching staff reminds me of the Oakland A's, 72, 73, when they won three world championships in a row. They never make mistakes under pressure. When there are men on base, they do not make any mistakes. Fred McGriff, base hit left field. He is now 10 for his last 17 trips to the plate. And that's the first Atlanta hit of the night. McGriff is just a good hitter. You get the ball out over the plate. He drives it. You pitch him inside. He fights it off. This was a fastball in, and he, all he did was fight it off. Now watch. This fastball is inside, and he fights it off to left field. You know, but you get the ball out over the plate, and he drives it. So I think they need to throw him a few more breaking balls, these left-handers do. They started him off with one, but that's all they threw him in that at bat for a strike anyway. Here's Mike Devereaux having himself a good NLCS, filling in for Dave Justice in right field tonight. Strike one. Indians with the three spot in the bottom of the first inning against Seattle. Strike now to Mike Devereaux. So I shoot Greg Maddox over in the dugout but again. There was a there was a performance here last night, Joe, where he didn't have his best stuff early on, but the Reds didn't get to him and he got stronger as the evening went along. He looks like a professor, and that's the way he pitches. He outsmarts everyone else. He looks like when he's standing on the mound, he looks like he's a professor because he's smarter than everyone else, and he figures out how to get them out. He knows what to do with each and every hitter that walks up there. Two and one. I was thinking about the way Maddox pitches. As a hitter, I imagine he makes you work harder. Like yes. you, you, he takes the instinct away and makes you start to think more of the play. I think that's the proper point there. He takes your natural instincts away. He makes you have to think with him. And he figures he can outthink you. Two and two. Actually sitting there on the bench kind of remind me of Clark Kent. Has his glasses on, then he walks out to the mound, takes the glasses off, and he's Superman. I'm sure the Reds think that way <laughs> anyway. Two two pit. Breaking ball up the middle. Larkin will take it. Tag and throw. Double play. So the Reds, who haven't gotten very many breaks in this series, get one there. Well, uh, two good things happen there. This is a breaking ball. Watch the position that Shirk is in. He's in good fielding position. And he fights the ball off. He gets a piece of it enough to slow it down so Larkin can make the play at second and then throw it to first for the out. So actually, the fielding position there helped Shurik. If he'd have fallen off to one side or the other, that would have been a base hit to center field. So good fielding there by Shurik. So nobody on and two out now. And here is Javi Lopez on the breaking ball. Hit hard. And Larkin can't handle it. Johnny mentioned that infield yesterday and how quick it is, and it's hard to gauge the hops. In fact, this ball gets to him so quickly that Larkin cannot move forward. You have to start moving forward on the ground ball. See, he waits on it. He has to wait on it because it gets there so quickly, and then it bounces up on him. So he doesn't have a chance to go forward. You have to be moving forward on dirt. Joe, is there a significant adjustment to be made when teams change from artificial turf to natural grass? A big adjustment because your first reaction should be to start forward. 
Here's Ryan Klesko. Swings on the first pitch, hits it in the air, short left field. Ron Gant is there. The error does no damage to the Cincinnati Reds. The Braves leave one. We've played two here in Atlanta, and we're scoreless. Field. What do you think down there? Well, when we got out here early and it was dry and it wasn't as wet as it was, there's, there's all, it's all gravel, isn't it, Joe? I mean, we saw that, and I know as a, as a second field baseman or an infielder, you know you're going to get some funny hops. Well, you have to. I mean, it's gravel out there. It's really not dirt. Mark Lewis, leadoff hitter for the Reds here in the third inning. No score. Lewis just one out of three in the league championship series so far, and he follows that one at the plate. One, two. When you think of the infield around the leg, you think of dirt, you know, smoothing it out and, and getting true bounces. A lot of little pieces of gravel out there. I mean, that's what it's made up of. You're, so you're definitely going to get some bad hops. The two pitches too low, a ball and two strikes. I mean, you think of the infield dirt, you yeah. think dirt, you don't think yeah. gravel, you don't <laughs> think sand. Exactly. It's more gravel and sand than anything else out there. Two pitch just misses inside. That's even now two balls and two strikes. Maybe start a trend, Joe, and not call it the infield dirt. Anymore. Okay, on the gravel. Oh, the non grass. How's that? <laughs> non grass. Two two. Foul off to the right side. I was talking to you before the game, Joe, about. How is it that, you know, that a whole team can go into a slump, and, and, and why is hitting so contagious? Yes. Obviously, a problem the Reds have to do with another broken bat to short Billy Out number one. Well, let me answer that question. First of all, hitting is more mental than people realize. And when you see one of your teammates walk up there and get a base hit, you think, well, I'm going to follow suit. Let's take a look at this pitch. This is a broken bat, fastball in, and he shatters Lewis's bat. Easy play for Belliard, but just another example of how well the Braves are moving the ball around, staying out of, out of the middle of the plate. They're on the inside corner or the outside corner. And that will cause you a lot of broken bats. We saw one broken off the end of the bat. Now we've seen one broken at the handle. But hitting is contagious. I mean, it's all, it has always been that way. Pete Shork is the hitter. He pops this one foul, and this is playable. Chipper Jones for the second half. And we'll go to the top of the order in Jerome Walton, and, and just in the opposite fashion, if, for instance, Reggie Sanders could have broken through against Greg right. Maddox last night in the third inning with a base hit, there's no telling what the rest of the lineup might have done. Could have changed the whole series because, first of all, I mean, pressure starts to build when you leave runners on base. So the next guy walks up there, he wants to hit a six-run homer instead of hitting a single to drive in one run. And you always want to start, you try to do it too much yourself, and that's what happens. There's too much pressure builds up. That one fall at the plate. And he cracked his bat. What are they making these bats out of these days, balsa? Well, remember, we were standing down there, and I looked at a couple of bats in the bat rack. I mean, they are brands that I have never heard of. Yeah, but what did you do? You chose Charlie O'Brien's bat, well, the one he hit a three-run homer with last night. Well, I wanted to know what he had hit that home run with. When it was a bat I'd never seen before. I mean, when I was playing, and John, it was Louisville Sluggers and Adirondacks and things like that. That now, one was a Glomar or something. Yeah, like right. I've never seen it before. So there are a lot of different styles now, a lot of different types of bats. Some, obviously, they say are some are harder than the others. And you, obviously, you want the hardest one you can get. That's a source of pride for a pitcher when he breaks your bat off. You're right. Well, they call it getting in their kitchen. You know, you get in your kitchen. They steal your refrigerator and take all your <laughs> drinks out. <laughs> they like that. I mean, you're right. They'll walk back to the dugout. He'll walk back to the dugout and say, did you see me get in this kitchen? I mean, they actually talk that way. Pitchers do. But hitters are the same way. They'll come back after they drill somebody or they hit a home run and says, did I get him or what? <laughs> Nolan Ryan left you nothing but the pulse. <laughs> <laughs> one, one pitch. 
Speed, one and two. Jerome Walton out in center field tonight. And looking for a little more production out of that position than he's been getting. I think Thomas Howard may have both of those hits. Two and two. Walton, the strikeout victim, his first time up leading off the game. And he is again angry with himself. Avery has his third K of the night. We'll go to the last of the third. Welcome back to Atlanta as we move to the last half of the third inning. Rafael Belliard, Steve Avery, and Marquise Grissom to face Pete Shurik. And there's a foul ball, strike one. Sharing a little booth time with us up here. Gentleman on your right is Clyde Drexler. Clyde the Glide. And Carol Dawson, Houston Rockets assistant coach, members of the NBA world champion Houston Rockets in town to play the Atlanta Hawks tomorrow. Foul back. 0 oh 2. Two time NBA world champion. Russ. Back to back Houston Rockets. Fifth inning, you and Clyde are going to do a jump ball, okay? <laughs> I was a shooter. I stayed out front. Off the end of the bat in the center field for a base hit. Belliard just protecting the plate on an 0-2 pitch and puts it up the middle and he's on. Well, the pitch is up is the big problem. Watch this up and out over the plate. He just kind of lays his bat on it and drives it back through the middle for a base hit. Belliard not a great hitter, but he does get a few hits and he gets the job done. I mean, he is a very valuable player to have on the ball club. Of course, he's replacing Jeff Blauser, who is down with an injury, so... He's very valuable to these Atlanta Braves. Town meeting behind the mound. What to do about Steve Avery ready to lay down a bunt? Yeah, I was one. I've never seen an entire infield talk about a bunt situation. He Unless is. they're going to try a trick play. How tricky can this get, Joe? <laughs> Avery has laid down eight of them this year. He has also hit two home runs. He's going to swing. Belliard on the go. Short made the stop and threw him out. And now we're going to check out Pete Short. Well, Bobby Cox was trying to fight the defense. Look at Brett Butler. See, uh, Brett Boone, I'm sorry, how close he is at second base. That's why they let him hit away. Boone was way in at second base, and they let Shurik hit away, uh, Avery hit away to try to defuse the defense that they just put up. And Belliard was on the move, and you saw Boone gesture to first. And that's where he would throw it. Now, Shurik's pitching hand caught that line drive. Yes. Shurik saying he's okay. He'll throw a few just to be sure. There is some pain there, though. You see the expression in his face there when he released that ball. You know, it's interesting what Bobby Cox did there. When you're up three games to none, you can do right. things like that. You're exactly right. You don't have to play for a run here and a run there. You can be very aggressive. And the, the Reds caused him to do that by placing Boone into the baseline. He was going to be very shallow. So anything hit to the right side was probably going to go through for a base hit. You can see that he did, is still having some problem there. It's, I'm sure he's going to try to stay in the ball game, but it's not 100% okay. I mean, he, he does have some problems there, and it probably will come. The effect will be most difficult for him when he tries to throw the uh, breaking ball. So for now, at least, Shurik will stay on. And there is no activity in the Cincinnati bullpen as yet, but we'll keep an eye on it. 
Well, let's, keep, let's keep an eye on the first curveball he throws too to see what happens with it. Off speed for a swinging strike. And now the Cincinnati bullpen gets uh, a little activity going. He was great the first game, wasn't he? Too bad. And Desren pitched well enough to win. Well, there's the curveball, and it did break sharply there, so he may not have any problems after all, because that was a very good curveball. That was Dave Burba, incidentally, up and now throwing in the Reds' bullpen. Runner at second and one out. Gives me a chance to discuss a point I made last night, if I can, very quickly. And remember, I said you have to take a left hand. The left handed pitcher wells out two pitches before it's too late, and they did not. And a couple of pitches later, the guy hits a home run. Well, the reason they didn't take him out because Berba was not able to go last night. Berba had to fly home. His wife was having a baby, and he flew right back. But when he got here, his back had flared up, and he could not go into the game. But he would have put him in at that time. So I was able to find that out today. There's a foul ball. Well, that leaves open the question that if 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 your if your starting pitcher is beginning to lose it out on the mound, you're going to have to come with someone. Well, I'm just trying to so, so that I wouldn't be as callous as I seemed <laughs> last night when I said you take him out two pitches before it's too late, and I still feel that way. And I just wanted to point out that he was thinking that way also, but the guy he wanted out there was not available. Two two pitch to Grissom. Down the left field line. Ron Gant near the foul line. Crosses over into foul territory and makes the catch for the second out. So two out now with a runner in scoring position at second base. And here is Mark Lemke. Barry Larkin made a good play on him deep in the hole back in the first inning. Scoreless on two hits, the Reds scoreless on one hit, and Larkin has committed an error. Pitched to nine of them. Lemke didn't wait. Right. Here's Chipper Jones. Chipper Jones up the middle of the base hit. Lemke takes the turn and holds at second. Third hit of the inning. See, if you're Pete Shurek, though, really, you shouldn't mind that base hit. That was a good curveball. It's down. This is just good hitting by Chipper Jones. See, that pitch is almost out of the strike zone. He hits it up the middle. If you make a good pitch and they hit it, you really shouldn't be upset, but he should be upset with the two high pitches to Belliard and to Lemke, but not that one. That was just good hitting right there. Well, he better make some good pitches here. Here's Fred McGriff. Lemke at second, Chipper Jones at first. 
McGriff singled to lead off the second and was wiped out in the double play. Ball one. <laughs> Mentioned it last time. McGriff on a roll. Ten hits in his last 17 at bats. Good pitch. Ball ran down in the end, looked like a little change up back on the inside part of the plate, had the grip food. Is a rediscovered lost art, Joe, with, yes. with so many guys being enamored with an 85, 95 mile an hour fastball. Well, the pitch of the 80s was the split fingered fastball. The pitch of the 90s is the changeup. You're right. One two pitch. Santiago will corral that one in time to keep the runners at second and first. Well, that's the pitch they want to get McGriff out with is a curveball, but it's is breaking too sharply here. He's trying to throw a strike with it, of course, but it's breaking too sharply. And you see Santiago fighting it, getting in front of it, and holding the runners. Good play there by Santiago. But McGriff has been able to hit the fastballs that they've thrown him, so they wanted to go to a different speed. And quite naturally, if you're a left-handed pitcher, you want to use the curveball against him, but he has not been able to get it over the plate except in one instance, the first at bat. So he's gone to the changeup, and he's been able to fool him with it. Two balls, two strikes, two outs, two runners on base. For Atlanta, here in the last of the third, the Braves lead it 1 0. Fastball follows back. So that's why McGriff's a pretty good hitter right there. They've made pitches away and change ups out over the plate. Now they come in with a good fastball, which should have been the finisher. They were trying to finish this at bat with that fastball. He was strong enough just to fight it off. That's all he wanted to do, and he was able to do that. So when you get to certain situations, this is the pitch I want to finish you with. And that was the pitch right there, the fastball right inside, and he wasn't able to do it. Now what do you do? Back with the breaking ball. He hasn't been able to get that over. I would say the changeup. Fooled all of us. Up the middle. Larkin with the play. And the Braves have broken the scoreless tie. 1-0 Atlanta after three. We're coming back to Atlanta after this from your local station. Back to Atlanta. Call strike one as we start the fourth inning to Barry Larkin. He'll be followed by Ron Gant and Reggie Sanders. And as far as Pete Churik is concerned, let's check in downstairs with Johnny Bench. John. All right, Greg. Uh, Dave Johnson basically wants to take him out of the game. Pete Churik is pleading his case right now. He got a pretty good shot on that. And he said, look, you've done me a great job. Uh, are you got, what are you going to be able to do? And he said, I want to go out there. Davey Johnson says, no, I don't think so. And he's over marking the lineup card right now. All right, Johnny, thank you. So Dave Burba, Johnson got the signal from the bullpen that Dave Burba is ready. So the shot to the hand in the last inning will KO Pete Shorick for the rest of the night. As if the Reds didn't have enough part. You're right. Because he has been very effective. Even though he's given up a run in this ballgame, he's still thrown very well in the two games that he has pitched. base runner of the night for the Reds and we check in on the ALCS with Hannah Storm. Hannah. Greg in Cleveland, Andy Ben is facing Wayne Kirby, Tony Pena running on the pitch. Kirby, the grounder to third, the play goes to first. Pena sees the third isn't covered, so he keeps on running. And he reaches safely and then later scores on a Kenny Lofton sacrifice fly. So the Indians up 4-0 on some alert base running by Tony Pena, Greg. Tony Kenya doesn't smile enough in life. He will be ear to ear over that one. Big slow curve ball for a strike to Ron Gant. 
see a little difference in the pattern the second time around from Avery. He threw Gant fastballs and changeups the first time around. So what does he do? He starts him off with a curveball the second time around. You just can't trust those. No, you can't. Can. Not the Atlanta Braves pitchers. <laughs> There's Pete Short. Competitors want to stay in the game no matter what. You're right. Barry Larkin at first 51 stolen bases. In the bullpen it's quiet now but the word from the bullpen was that Burba was ready. Having loosened up last inning. What do you think, Joe? Does Davey Johnson try to get some excitement generated by running Barry Larkin? Well, that's called strike. One yeah, and two. I, I mean, I really think that Barry's on his own, so it's hope to him if he can pick a pitch, he's going to go. Uh, but you have to remember, he was picked off in last night's ball game, so that plays on his mind a little bit. But Barry Larkin is on his own. He will decide when he can get the jump and go. And you see he's done a very good job this year, only being caught five times and stealing 51. But again, they're all aware that Avery will pick you off. Ball and two strikes. Toward short. Belliard can't handle it. And Reds with runners at first and second. Belliard looked up a little too quickly on this play and you can't do that on this type of infield because the infield will give you some erratic hops. Joe that's been ruled a base hit. Well no, watch this. Now they've changed it to an error. Right, now watch this. Watch his face. Now look at his head. Watch. He is he did not stay with the ball long enough and this is a tough infield. You see right there he kind of loses sight of the ball bounces up on him. And bounces away. You have to keep your eyes on the ball on this infield, especially the way it's bouncing now. It has now been ruled an error, so each shortstop has committed an error. Runners at first and second, nobody out. Reggie Sanders fouls it back above us for strike one. Clyde Drexler to our right just had a heart attack. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Now Sanders has had a lot of situations and, and you can't put this Reds deficit at three at all on Sanders back. It's a team effort. Everyone has contributed. But he can get them started here in this situation. Foul ball. 0 oh and 2. And you see 7 for 32 against Avery, but he hit the two home runs this year. Remember, Avery struggled against the Reds. In a couple, you know, he struggled the entire season. So, if you're going to get him, this was the year to get him. He now has Sanders down, no balls, two strikes. One and two. Well, this is a good 0 2 pitch, meaning that it's borderline at best, and you can get the hitter to chase it sometimes. It is borderline, but again, it's where the ball crosses the plate, not where the catcher catches the ball. Hard to tell whether he just saw that pitch as missing or whether he might have been fooled by the pitch. One, two. Broken back toward short to second for one. The first double play. And with two out, we'll tell you this 1995 League Championship Series game is brought to you by Chevrolet. The cars and trucks 36 million people depend on every day. Genuine Chevrolet by Texaco Clean System 3 gasolines and by Bud Light. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never lets you down, make it a Bud Light. I'm telling you, broken bats galore. Ten of them in game two. Fastball in, he jams him, and the ball is perfect double play. One hopper to shortstop, six to four to three. That's the pitcher's best friend. See here again, fastball in. You see it jammed him. Couldn't get the barrel out there quick enough. Here's Mariano Duncan with a runner at third, the tying run at third, and two out. Six broken bats tonight, Joe. Well, the Atlanta Braves stay out of the middle of the plate, and this is the best example of it. There were ten bats broken in game two because they stay out of the middle of the plate. They use <laughs> they use the handle of the bat or the end of the bat. <laughs> they don't let you use the middle of the bat. Selling bats. Yeah. <laughs> you can make a great profit in this ballpark. That's a 
beautiful pitch right there. That may be the best fastball that he has thrown tonight. I mean, that one got there in a hurry right on the inside corner. Watch the target. Look at the target. Right there, he hits the target. And yet, Mariano Duncan can make things very right for the Reds with a base hit here. They have not had much timely hitting in this series. And not here in the fourth. Another strikeout for Avery. Tying run left to third. We'll go to the bottom of the fourth. One nothing Atlanta. Back in Atlanta for the bottom of the fourth, and Pete Shorick is back out on the mound. Davey Johnson just leaving. Let's go down to Johnny Benz. Johnny, what's going on? Well, Greg, he absolutely said, no, you're not going back out there to Davey Johnson. And Pete Shorick said, you know, it's like Joe said, hey, I may have all winter off. I won't, I'm not going to give this thing up. I had a good inning. I finished up strong. He said, well, I don't want to. I don't want you to go out there. And then the trainer came over, and he said, well, you can't hurt it anymore, I don't guess. Go back out there. But Davey walked out there to the mound to make sure as he warmed up, that his hand was okay and I'll tell you it's a lot of guts this kid's had the kind of year to be like that too and now Bobby Cox is going to hear from uh, the umpire saying it, it wasn't a trip to the mound well, it was just the fact that he wanted to check and see if he could go and when you're up three games to hey, run, Bobby know, Cox can hey. take just about anything yeah he said that's okay with me if that's the case okay umpire okay okay Jerry that's Jerry Davis Don Gullett with Davy Johnson in the Cincinnati bullpen. We'll go to the last of the fourth. Mike Devereaux, Javi Lopez, Ryan Klesko. Atlanta one, Cincinnati nothing. Ball one. I think John put it best. That if you're a competitor, as sure is, you do not want your season to end knowing that maybe I could have gone back out there. So I'll go until I can't go any longer. And that's what you want. That's what your teammates want. That's what they respect. You know, you'll gain, he'll gain a lot of respect from his teammates, not only for the rest of this season, but for next season as well. They'll know that he's a gamer. A ball on a strike. Off the mask of Santiago, one and two. Pete Shurek, the ex New York Met. He and Manager Dallas Green just didn't click. He was waved and what a pickup the Reds made acquiring Pete Shurek. Well, you're right, but Pete Shurek said that it wasn't New York's fault. He just was horrible there. Foul ball. Still one ball, two strikes. Yeah, Pete said it wasn't New York's fault. It wasn't Dallas Green's fault. He had some growing up to do. Two, two. The only thing you have to be careful of, you're sure, is you do not let it take your best pitch away, which is the curveball, and you just throw fastballs. He threw a change up and he left it up and he wasn't happy with himself, so basically he's gone to the fastball. You can't become a one pitch pitcher. There's a curveball up the middle. Larkin plays the hop and throws him out. And that was good feeling there by Larkin because the ball did take a funny hop at the end there. Watch this last hop. Watch when it hits the dirt. See it's down. See how it hops way up high. And see he has to raise up to get it. Good fielding position there by Larkin. I believe we can call that a gravel hop. <laughs> yeah, a gravel hop. Here's Javi Lopez. Lopez reached on a Larkin error back in the second inning. Indians now 4 nothing on the Mariners in the third. One and one. That was a good change up there. And it, and it seems to me that that's the pitch that bothers him most the way his hand is that he's gripping it because maybe he can't grip it tight enough. You want to grip the change up a little tighter so that you don't throw it as hard. Fastball low. Should the Reds survive tonight? Game five here tomorrow night. John Smiley would go for Cincinnati. And Tom Glavin for Atlanta. Into the bat, roller up the first baseline foul. And anyone that saw the first two games with Shurik and Smiley pitching knows. You, you know the Reds had an opportunity to win. And with those two guys on the mound, anytime they're out there, you have a, you have a good chance of winning. So 
if they win tonight, they may get a shot of adrenaline and, uh, you know, also have a good shot at tomorrow's ball game. Very difficult to win four in a row, but you have to take them one at a time. That one's inside, and the count is full of three and two. Let's just say right here that should the Reds mount a four-game comeback, not only is it a terrific rally in and of itself, but against a right. quality pitching staff. A well-rested pitching staff after tonight as well. Full count pitch. Curveball, line in the left field. Gant won't get there. Base hit. So Lopez reaches for the second time tonight. The more you see Lopez, the more you realize that he is not only a powerful hitter, but he is a good hitter as well. He knows how to handle the bat. When he gets behind an account, he gives up a little bit and tries to hit a line drive. When he's ahead, he tries to make you pay. He is going to be a real fine hitter. Here's Ryan Klesko struggling in the series so far. 23 home runs on the regular season. team in the National League in 1995. Fastball he pulls it toward the hole and the Boone makes a headlong dive comes down with it watch he has the presence to think about going to second base and he realizes I better take the one at first. I mean that's a full all out stretch. Smart to think and look at second first and then realizing I have to take one and get the guy first. Just a fine play there by Boone. So Lopez moves up to second with two out now and here's Belliard who singled his first time up curveball misses on the outside corner one and oh. Belliard singled on an 0 2 pit back in the third inning and eventually came around to score the game's only run on Mark Lemke's RBI single. Belliard hitting down in the order has produced and he's had teammates at second and or third. Well, Santiago's going out to talk to Short. And if you look at the situation, you have a runner at second, two outs. You're already down one to nothing. You do you can't afford to fall behind two to nothing. So you're trying to make good pitches to Belliard, but if you miss and make a mistake and he gets a base hit, then you're down two to nothing. You're always better off, in my opinion, going ahead and pitch to the pitcher. The reason they don't walk him and pitch to the pitcher is they do not want to let the leadoff hitter lead off next inning. I think you have to get out of this inning first and then worry about next inning. Sure, it finds the outside corner, two balls and a strike. him out swinging at that high pitch but the, the Braves with Lopez at second and Belliard up most of the outfielders are playing shallow with the exception of Walton in center field a base hit to center field he could score easily but it base hit to right or left they would have a shot at it. Belliard has not hit a home run in 1663 at bats. 2 2 pitch foul off to the right side. Pete Shurek has given up one, two, three, four, five hits tonight, all singles. And that's not unusual for him. Look at that. 15 out of 16. That's good pitching. And you keep the other team in the ballpark, and normally you will win. Mike Piazza with a home run. The only one to reach Shurek for more than one base. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Curve ball, got him on the outside corner. The pitch Davey Johnson likes to see Shorick throw for a strike. 
We've played four one nothing Braves. This is about first. The Indians keep pouring it on at Jacobs Field. Bottom of the third and one out. A man on for Jim Tomei. It's a two run shot off Andy Bennis. His second home run of the postseason. The Indians with a huge lead over the Mariners. Six nothing in the third. Greg and Joe. All right, Hannah. And with that Cleveland bullpen, I think that uh, pretty good chance that the Cleveland Indians are going to end up 2-2 at the end of this evening. Welcome back to Atlanta, everyone, along with Joe Morgan and Johnny Bench downstairs. I'm Greg Gumble. This is a typical game in this series. The Reds have been in every game in this right. series. It's just that down the stretch, they can't produce, and they end up on the short end. Well, what has happened to them lately, and the, down the stretch, they've given up the big home run. The Braves pitchers down the stretch have not made any, any mistakes. You know, typical of the Reds was the game they lost in Cincinnati. They had an 0-2 count on Klesko. He swung and missed two pitches poorly, and then they bounce a pitch. In a wild pitch, a guy scores. The Braves do not make those kind of mistakes, and that's been the difference in the in the three-game series. And Santiago chases and helps Avery on the first pitch to him. 0-1. Santiago, Brett Boone, Mark Lewis here in the top of the fifth inning. Free swinger, usually, yet he's drawn five bases on balls. And that's that is correct. He is usually a free swinger. But he's also a guy that he can use the bat. I mean, he can go the other way, he can do a lot of things with the bat. Even though it seems that he prefers to pull the ball most of the time. Another good change up on the outside corner. A ball and two strikes. sequence to tell you that he is hitting pretty well because normally you do not see a pitcher throw three straight changeups. He has thrown Santiago three straight changeups. It means that he has hit him well off his fastball before and his curveball. So he's going to make sure that he throws him a changeup. He wants to get him out with a changeup. One two pitch. Down and in two balls and two strikes. Look at where Ryan Klesko is playing. They are giving Benito Santiago the whole left field line. That's a little bit unusual when you have a left-handed pitcher on the mound that throws changes. Usually we've seen a lot of balls pulled down to third base in this series because all these pitchers throw changes. 2-2 two -two pitch. Fastball. And the count is full. Well, if he stays with the same pattern, this will be a 3-2 changeup. Santiago gets the majority of his hits to left field. There's a changeup. Well, I think uh, I just think that he got Santiago, threw him a two two fastball, and he just got him thinking, well, maybe he will throw me a fastball. And he takes something off the pitch. I mean, there's just nothing else you can say except these guys know how to pitch. And whatever you're looking for, they're throwing the other one. Strikeouts now for Peach for uh, Steve Avery rather. And here's Brett Boone who made the fine play in the field last inning. And he starts him off with the changeup. Remember, I said at the beginning of the telecast, if he keeps the changeup down, he will pitch very well. And every pitch he's throwing now is down and right on the spot. He seems to be gaining momentum as this ball game goes along. Bad for a 25 year old. That one nubbed off the end of the bat toward the first base dugout. 0 and 2. Boone flied out to left to end the second inning in his only trip to the plate tonight. Braves 1, Reds nothing. Jammed him. McGriff in foul territory.
two up and two gone and here's Mark Lewis. Well it's easy to see why the Reds are struggling. I mean they're just being kept off balance. You do not see any swings that have good extension on them or that they're fouling the balls out in front of the plate. They're either early on the pitches or late as we just saw from Brett Boone. That one's off speed and in the strike zone. The Reds scored 5.2 runs a game in the regular season. That was the second highest in the National League. They have scored five runs in three games. Three and a fraction in this series. Greg, remember we did a, the Friday night game there when the Braves made their last trip to Cincinnati and they were shut down by Schmoltz. The next day it was Maddox and Glavin, all three of them. That really set the stage for where we are now. What the Braves did going in there is really find out exactly how they wanted to pitch each hitter. They stuck with it and they've continued right on through this series. They have beaten the Reds the last six ball games. Outside corner, two and two. Avery has allowed one hit tonight, a single to Santiago back in the second inning. And Bobby Cox is a little amazed. He says, this is not the same guy that pitched the entire season. I mean, he is putting on a show here because if you saw Avery earlier in the season, how he was struggling with his location, with his changeup, not being able to throw it over the plate, getting hurt with fastballs in the middle of the plate and you watch him tonight you say this is a completely different pitcher and that's what Bobby Cox is shaking his head about. Two two pitch fouled off Avery in his last three starts. One and oh in 21 innings a 1.29 earned run average. So he found something. Yes. Two to Lewis, ball three. And we talked about hitting being contagious. Pitching is probably contagious too. When you're on a staff and you watch Glab and you watch Maddox, you watch Smoltz go out there every day and do what they do, and you follow them, you have to know something. You learn something. And he is the youngest of the group. And it's obvious shared information has a lot to do with that. Four count pitch, breaking ball misses, and Lewis is on base. The big surprise there is not so much that he walked him, but the big surprise that he threw him a breaking ball instead of a straight change. I think that's the biggest surprise of, of all. But I think Bobby is shaking his head on this one simply because now that gets the pitcher to the plate, and it will have let the Reds start next inning off with their leadoff hitter batting first. Pete Shorek hit 220 during the regular season, but hitless in the postseason. Out to third back in the third inning. Quick throw to first. This is the quickest way for a left hander to get the ball to first base. Step off and throw while you're stepping off. Anytime you have to let use your leg kick, it takes a little longer to get it over. And sure it shows a two out punt. Didn't move. Now watch the target. See the target? I mean, 
Although you have to say maybe the umpire was correct because Lopez did turn it in. You know, he turned his glove in, which is usually usually means that maybe he thought it was an inch or so off the plate. Was it much more than that? No. <laughs> pitchers don't usually get that kind of call anyway. When you're a hitter, you're a pitcher hitting, he's usually called out on those pitches. Two two. Called off. Short doing a good job with the bat. Steve Avery's pitch count pretty high for two out in the top of the fifth inning. Yeah, but the 51 strikes, 35 based on 35 balls, not that bad for him. And I'll explain why. Next inning, I'll explain why. <laughs> Called third strike on the outside corner. Avery has thrown five shutout innings. He and the Braves lead one nothing. Daytime running. And we remind you tomorrow, NBC Sports presents more exciting NFL action beginning at 12:30 Eastern with the NFL on NBC. A lot of people thought Bill Parcells and the Patriots would be the toast of to the AFC some this season, and some even thinking they'd be Super Bowl contenders. Instead, it's been disarray. Tune in tomorrow, 12:30 Eastern time. A special inside look: Patriot problems, broken dreams. The NFL on NBC tomorrow. I'll be watching. Who doesn't, Joe? <laughs> Atlanta fans with the brooms looking for the sweep here tonight. The Reds looking to live to fight another day. Steve Avery will lead it off for the Atlanta Braves in the fifth inning and into the top of the order, Marquise Grissom and Mark Lemke. was Avery shot back up the middle in third inning that hit Shorick on the pitching hand and left him questionable as far as continuing but Shorick is hung tough curveball misses ball one and that's the respect for Avery because Avery is a pretty good hitter so he doesn't want to throw him a first pitch fastball down the middle dribbler up the third base line this is a tough play Shorick throws He tries to make the play. Avery runs well. No chance for Lewis to get there in time. Off balance throw. Couldn't get quite enough on it, but good hustle there by Avery and a nice play by Shurik. Avery rips one back up the middle off of Shurik and yeah. throws him out. And now a little number up third base line, and he's on first. Now Marquise Grissom, 0 for 2 tonight. Grissom's wife, Tia. And Grissom does not show bunt as he takes ball one. I don't think you would bunt him in this situation if you're Bobby Cox. Again, remember Bobby Cox is playing with all the chips in front of him. He can take chances, try to break it open. He can do a lot of different things here. You know, if the series is 1-2 in the Reds' favor, you may see a bunt in this situation. But here, I think everything is in his favor. Just turn him loose and let him play. pitch for short because Grissom's a good triple hitter. He's a good fastball hitter, especially when he knows it's coming. Foul back. He made a good pitch. He got it in on him a little bit. He threw him the fastball, but he got it in a little bit. If he get that pitch out over the plate, he probably would have hit it hard someplace. And that's what you have to do. You can't just throw a 2 0 fastball down the middle. You have to find one part of the plate, either the outside edge or the inside edge. You have to stay out of the middle. Base hit right field. Avery held up to make sure the ball went through and stops at second. Seven hits now for the Braves. 
Good hitting by Grissom. He went inside. Now he goes outside, and Grissom just goes with the pitch. I mean, that's good hitting, and that's some of the things we're not seeing done with the Reds. Balls inside. They try to pull, but when they go back away, they do not go the other way with them. Boone has no chance on that one. Prince now with another one of those meetings out by the mound. Well, this is to decide whether they're going to use the rotation play where the third baseman charges, the shortstop goes to third to cover because this is a bunting situation right here. With Lemke up, this is a perfect bunting situation. This is what you're what you want if you're the Atlanta Braves. You want to have a one to nothing lead. You want to have the first two runners on here in the sixth inning, in the fifth inning, and you want to try to move them along. And now umpire Jerry Davis is going to be the spoil sport to go out there and break it up. Well, there's so many variations off the rotation play. You know, you can have Larkin break right away and have the second baseman sneak in for a pickoff at second. You can do a lot of different things, and I, I think that's why you have the meeting so they can decide and make sure that all of them are on the same, that you're using the same script here. Lemke was the best on the team during the regular season at laying down the sacrifice bunt. It was his base hit back in the third that brought home the only run of the game. That's the rotation play. Larkin was going to third. Mark Lewis charged way in. And that's, that's the play that they were going to use on that particular back out pitch. We'll see if they change it again. Because the Braves can change too and let Lemke swing. All right, here we go again because you have to make sure that everyone knows what's happening. You can't have two guys going one way and another guy going a different way. So that's why you see all the meetings in this situation. And Mariano Duncan is not the usual first baseman. Right. Only the 19th game he has played first base this season. He's starting his 13th in place of Hal Morris. Larkin pulled over close to second base now. A different play. Ball two. So they did not have the rotation play on there. And really the shortstop gives it away because if he's going to break from third and beat the base runner he has to cheat a little bit toward third and if he's not going obviously he wants to hold the runner at second as close as possible so if you can read the shortstop you know it's like reading a, a defense in football you read the shortstop he tells you what to do or what they're going to do. Duncan stays at second the butt caught by Duncan. The last thing Lemke wanted to do. But Lemke was trying to go the other way. Normally you bunt this ball to the third base when that's who you want to field it. But he actually tried to bunt it towards first base and hit a line drive to Mariano Duncan. And Lemke showing his disapproval. Here's Chipper Jones. Called third strike and a base hit for the rookie. Strike one. But Lemke's upset because he knows if he would have gotten the bunt down, they have runners at second and third with one out and their big guys coming up. Chances are they're going to score. And they could, did have a chance of maybe putting this ball game out of reach for the Reds. A one pitch misses, one and one. Dave Burba back up in the Cincinnati bullpen. Chipper Jones, three home runs in the postseason, one of them in this LCS. A two run shot last night. 1 1. Ball two. Last night, Chipper Jones goes the other way against Xavier Hernandez in the seventh inning. That extended Atlanta's lead. Two one pit. Two two. Chipper Jones just one behind Chuck Knobloch for the most hits by a rookie in postseason. Two balls, two strikes. And we'll do it all over again. The 
inside. The count is full at three and two. Well, if you're Bobby Cox, what do you do here? I say you do not run them because you have a pitcher at second base, but anytime you start a runner, you open up some holes, and when you start two runners, you open up two holes. So you never know exactly what Bobby's thinking here, so we'll see what happens. Steve Avery is at second, Marquise Grissom at first. Full count to Chipper Jones, one out, one nothing. Atlanta leads in the bottom of the fifth. And he bounces it for ball four, and the bases are loaded. Well, Chipper Jones' wife, Karen, says, uh, I'll take that. Well, one thing to note there, they showed that young fella a lot of respect. The 3 2 change up there, no. Freddie McGriff with the bases loaded. They prefer to try to throw the change up, and now they have to pay the consequences because they have to get Freddie McGriff out now. So Chipper Jones has earned a lot of respect from the Cincinnati Reds. During the regular season, Fred McGriff grounded into 19 double plays. That was the fourth most in the National League. Pete Shurik would like nothing better here. Popped up. Santiago. To move two steps for out number two. Well, the great thing there is that he got the fastball in tight. I mean, you have to make good pitches under pressure, and we've talked about how often the Braves have done that. But this is a pressure pitch right here. He gets the fastball above the belt and inside, and McGriff pops it up. So two out now with the bases loaded. Here's Devereaux. Ground out into grounded into a double play in the second and bounced to Larkin in the fourth. Playing right field tonight in place of the injured David Justice. If you joined us late, Justice was hit on the knee in batting practice by a batted ball. The same place that he knocked the foul ball off of the inside of his right knee, so Bobby sat him down in favor of Devereaux. Strike one. Well, he had not thrown a first pitch strike since the third inning. He started McGriff off with a strike, and he starts Devereaux off with a strike. No balls. One strike to Mike Devereaux. Bases loaded. Two out. Strike two call. Atlanta with a run in the bottom of the third. Leads it. One nothing. Looking for more. Leading this National League Championship Series three games to none and looking to put the cap on it and head to the World Series. 0 2 pitch to Devereaux. Got him swinging. So Pete Shorick comes back and knocks the Braves down. We've played five in Atlanta. 1 0 Braves. And you just saw Pete Shurik get out of a bases loaded jam. And in Cleveland, Indian starter Ken Hill had Mariners on second and third and no outs. But he gets Mike Blowers looking. Then Luis Soho strikes him out looking. And then he gets Dan Wilson to ground out to end the inning. So Hill in his first postseason start, pitching a shutout through four. All right, Hannah, along with Joe Morgan and Johnny Bench, I'm Greg Gumbel. Top of the sixth inning. Jerome Walton, Barry Larkin, Ron Gant to face Steve Avery. Well, Greg, if that performance by Short there doesn't lift his ball club, then nothing can because that was the series right there. I mean, if the Braves could have broken the game open right there and he got out of the jam without any run scoring, that should give you a lift. Walton 0 for 2 with a couple of strikeouts so far tonight. in this game the Braves have gotten their leadoff man on in the inning. Tapper up the first baseline tough play Avery in a hurry nice job by Steve Avery. Well he showed that he was a good athlete by beating out the, the top bunt that he hit down the swinging bunny hit down the third baseline now he feels his position perfectly a two and oh change up and Walton hits it off at the end of the bat and this is a tough play. Grabs it barehanded, throws off balance, and makes a perfect throw. I mean, this is what you call feeling your position. No one else.
Ross could have made that play. The catcher couldn't get there in time. Here's Barry Larkin. Walked in the fourth and he eliminated in a double play. With the Reds fall here, they will see changeups in their nightmares <laughs> during the offseason. You're probably correct. I mean, two and zero pitch to the leadoff hitter here in the, in the top of the sixth inning. He comes back with a changeup. I mean, and he gets him out. He gets him out front, hits it off the end of the bat, and then he throws him out. So the Braves are making the pitches that they have to make. I mean, you have to give them credit. But there, there comes a time in the you have to wonder. You say, are the Braves pitchers as good as they look? And are the Reds hitters as bad as they look? Yeah, you have to wonder about the yeah, law of average. You really do because, you know, I can talk about how well they're pitching because they are, but there's still an element here that the Reds can control. You don't have to swing at 2 and 0 changeups, you know, especially when you, you know, you're leading off an inning. You can make yourself get, you can get a better pitch for yourself to hit. And I think that's what has to happen. One ball, two strikes to Larkin. Fastball misses 2-2. Two, two. I mean, that, that's what baseball is all about, numbers and averages. And right. you have to think that these Cincinnati Reds, sooner or later, are going to break out of it and in a big way. And that's the point. And, and, and it goes back to yesterday's ballgame. They had some chances. If they could have gotten the base hit yesterday in a couple of key situations, then they would have taken a lot of pressure off themselves for today. There is a lot of pressure on today. 2-2 and Larkin fouls that one off down the right field line. But Fought I mean, it off. Yeah, that's the point. What is a good swing? I mean, if you ask someone on the Reds now, what is a good swing? I don't know if they can tell you because they're being kept off balance. I get the feeling that if a Larkin or a Gant or a Sanders tags one, right, that Cincinnati dugout will erupt. And that's always something that can happen. I mean, if you keep swinging, it can't happen. 55 footer. Three and two now to Larkin. Since we've talked about hitting being contagious, it does not take much. I'm just say maybe two consecutive guys hitting the ball hard in the gap or something to change the whole complexion of, of, of the game. This game, and particularly the, the, the way the Reds think when they go to the plate. Right now, each guy thinks it's on his shoulders to win or lose this ball game, and that's tough. And as we mentioned earlier, each one of these games has gone exactly like this one. Yes. 3 2 pitch to Barry Larkin. Toward the hole. Hilliard, long throw. Didn't get it. No chance. Whenever you have to go that deep, Barry Larkin will beat it out because he runs very well. But that was a 3 2 changeup. But Barry got enough of it that he pulls it in the hole. And from right that point right there, it's a base hit. Belliard doesn't have the strongest of arms, but it's also very difficult for anyone to throw Barry Larkin out from that deep in the hole. Only the second hit of the night for the Cincinnati Reds, and with Ron Gant at the plate, Barry Larkin, a base dealer, do you send him? Does he run? I say yes, but again, you have to make sure you get a good jump. Slide step outside ball one. That's what you have to be careful of. And remember, Larkin was on first his last time up. He got a walk. And he didn't steal. They ended up hitting into a double play. So the point is, you can't sit there and wait for something to happen. You have to try to make things happen. A little rustling in the Atlanta bullpen with this Avery's 100th pitch, and his 100th pitch he throws to Fred McGriff. And that was an ugly pickoff. <laughs> I mean, he changed his motion entirely. And Pedro Bourbon begin to throw in the Atlanta bullpen. Two balls, no strikes now to Ron Gant. And we talked about Shurik having tough pitches to make when he's behind. This is a tough pitch for Avery. You know, with Ron Gant up there, if Gant gets his pitch, obviously he can hit the ball out of the ballpark. So you have to stay away from a certain zone. Now, whether he will throw a changeup or some or a fastball in a different location, we'll have to see. Changeup. Two and one. Twice this season, Ron Gant beat his ex-teammates with extra inning home runs. See, I think that was smart hitting there by Gant. Two and old, don't swing at that changeup. Try you look for a fastball. If you get it, you hit it. Double 
play ball. Jag and we see tonight. Welcome back for the home half of the sixth inning. Atlanta looking to close it out tonight. They have a one nothing lead on Cincinnati. Steve Avery has shut the Reds down on two hits tonight as we go to the bottom of the sixth inning. Javi Lopez to lead it off. Greg, I looked at my scorebook. The Reds have hit only one ball out of the infield. Brett Boone hit a fly ball to left field. Everything else is going to pop up on the infield, ground out or strike out. Steve Avery has been in charge. Line drive, center field, base hit. This 1995 League Championship Series game is brought to you by Toyota and their full line of quality cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. By McDonald's, have you had your break today? And by Bud Light, if you want great taste that won't fill you up and never lets you down, make it a Bud Light. Lopez on, and here's Ryan Klesko. Swings on the first pitch, falls it behind the plate. the sixth thing and that'll bring Raphael Belliard to the plate. We remind you the LCS will continue here on NBC tomorrow night. If the Braves wrap it up then you will see the Seattle Mariners and the Cleveland Indians from Cleveland. But if the Reds should prevail here tonight. Joe and I and we'll be back here for uh, game five. With the Reds trying to claw their way back into it. With a single in the third and looking at a third strike in the fourth. Now the Braves are warming Quants up rapidly. As if, ball on the up. if they have an opportunity here to score another run, they're probably going to use a pinch hitter. And they may use a pinch hitter even if they do not have a runner in scoring position. Charlie O'Brien is out with a bat. Hit a three run homer here last night. So Steve Avery. Done for the evening. Well, you look at Avery tonight. He walked Reggie Sanders to lead off the second and then got a double play ball. He walked Barry Larkin to lead off the fourth. Gant reached on an error and then he got Reggie Sanders to hit into a double play. And then with a runner on and one out in the sixth inning, he got Ron Gant to hit a double play ball. Avery threw only six double play grounders all season long. He has three here tonight in six innings. Pitch out. Well, this is interesting. They're trying to butt him into scoring position, try to get that insurance run because, as you mentioned, they, they've decided they're going to pinch hit for Avery. So they're having Belliard bunt Lopez into scoring position. But they may switch to a hit and run. You never know. He has a lot of options. Up 
the first baseline that rolls foul. So it's one and two now to Belliard. John? Well, the thing they want to do is they don't want Belly Art to hit into a double play. They don't want, they're definitely taking Avery out when they're doing this. You know, Charlie O'Brien on deck, of course, but they don't want to lose it because they wouldn't change any position players. And then they'd have to have the pitcher in the ninth place unless Bobby Cox had to make a double switch. All right, John. I hate those double switches, Joe. They've just <laughs> they wrecked the scorecard. One two pitch to Belly Art. Swinging and fouls it past third. I don't know how true it is, but someone told me that they've given Green, Gene Mock credit for starting all this fad of the double switches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know how true that is, but Gene was smart enough to be somebody that tried something like that or started something like that. For good manager. Yes, very smart. No, no really knows a lot about this game. Two pitch to Belliard. Two two. Avery has seen his last work, and you have to wonder if we're seeing the last of Pete Shirk tonight. Well, that's a good point, and, and Shirk has pitched very well as he did in the first ball game of the series. Dave Burba up and throwing again in the Cincinnati bullpen. Here's the two two pitch to Belliard. Curveball got him looking. Second consecutive at bat. Belliard has looked at a third strike. Well, that's another curveball. This is what he struck him out on last time looking. He got him on a three on a curveball again. But Belliard will say, hey, I scored the go-ahead run. Here's Charlie O'Brien. Got a standing ovation from the crowd here last night. And get some applause as he steps into the batter's box here in a pinch hitting role. Charlie said after the game when he was a kid, he used to play in his backyard and pretend he was Johnny Bench. I'm sure, a lot of young catchers did that. This was the scene last night. Charlie O'Brien tags David Wells. For a three run homer. That was in the bottom of the sixth inning and gave the Braves a three nothing lead at the time. They went on to win at 5 2. 2 0. out without any damage one nothing Braves we're coming back after this from your local station away from him so he can't pull the ball and they're trying to stay away from everyone's power now because one swing of the bat of course could tie the ball game and that could do what you said give the Reds some momentum so they're staying away from everyone's power Santiago went after one way out of the strike zone Two strikeouts in the inning for McMichael. We go to the bottom of the seventh. The fans taking their seventh inning stretch. Hal Morris is the new first baseman for the Cincinnati Reds. He replaces Mariano Duncan. Eddie Taubensey replaces Benito Santiago behind the plate. And out on the mound, Mike Jackson comes on to replace a very game and effective Pete Shurik tonight. You're right. I think everyone needs to tip their hat to Pete Shurik. He pitched very gallantly. And Mike Jackson comes in, good fastball, excellent slider, and he's developed a changeup. So it'll be up to him to keep the Reds within one swing of the bat and give themselves a chance in the eighth and the ninth. They're down to six outs, so you cannot afford to fall any farther behind right now. Grissom, Lemke, Chipper Jones, the top of the Atlanta batting order to face Jackson. Strike one. 
Marquise Grissom. Eight game hitting streak in the postseason. First time in Major League history, three teammates have each hit safely in the same eight straight games in a single postseason. <laughs> 0 2, the count on Grissom. They can to get him out 
but they're without letting him drive in the run. And Chipper was trying to hit <laughs> hit that one into the upper deck. Chipper Jones saw his pitch right there on two and zero. Oh. That was not your sacrifice fly swing right there. Two balls, one strike. Runner at third, one out, one nothing Braves. Ball three. You have to go after Jones because you do not want to count on McGriff hitting into a double play, even though, as you mentioned, he's hit into 19 this year. You do not want to have to count on that. You'd rather try to get Jones out than not even have to pitch to McGriff. Missed inside, ball four. So after striking out in the first inning, Jones with a single and two walks, and here's Fred McGriff. And now you've got to pitch to Fred McGriff. And you also have to hope that he hits a ground ball so you can get out of this. You can no longer play the infield in at short and second because then you give up too much. You have to try to get yourselves in a position to make a double play and get out of this with a ground ball. Don Gullett, the pitching coach, is going to come out and talk because I'm not sure they know exactly how they want to pitch to McGriff. You know, different pitchers have different pitches that are their best pitches in this situation. Jackson's best pitch I would think in this situation is either a good sinker or the hard slider but they may want to throw McGriff something else because he's hit the hard stuff they may want to throw him some change ups well tonight McGriff single leading off the second inning grounded out to short to end the third and then with the bases loaded and one out in the fifth swung at the first pitch and fouled out to the catcher and you mentioned that McGriff hit into a lot of double plays, but Mike Jackson does not induce a lot of double plays because he's a strikeout pitcher with a hard slider and usually a riding fastball. Although I've seen him throw a couple of sinkers tonight, and we'll just see how they want to attack him. So they want to attack him with the off speed stuff, some changeups. This is the outside corner, a ball and no strike. McGriff has hit everything else. He's hit the fastball. He's hit the hard slider. So you have to go a different way, and that's what they're trying to do here. But you have to throw strikes with it. First and third. One out. Ball two. It's not going to sound smart, but the Reds are in a position where, you know, if you walk McGriff, so what? I mean, it's almost at that point. Rather than give in to him, and give him a fastball down the middle. And this one gets off Cummins. He's glove. The runner comes home. Two nothing Braves. Tobinzi just into the game, replacing Benito Santiago. Charged with the pass ball. Well, they were staying out in the middle of the plate. High fastball. Ball three balls away and it was kind of interesting that they brought Tom at the end anyway because they only had two catchers but I know what he was thinking he wanted to leave Jackson in so now it's no choice they're just going to walk in the so that puts runners at first and second setting up the double play possibility again for Mike Devereaux Right. I, as I said, if you would have walked McGriff in that situation, it wouldn't have been the end, you know, the toughest thing for the Reds to happen. But they ended up trying not to pit give in to him, and they end up with a wild pitch. So now the bases should be loaded, and they have a double play situation, but now the run is already in. Devereaux 0 for 3 and hit into a double play back in the second inning. 2 9 and 1 for the Braves. No runs, two hits and an error for Cincinnati. Jackson wants to talk it over with Tobinson. Go back to that pass ball. Not a difficult pitch to handle at all. No, he, he actually just did not open his glove. It hit the finger, the heel of his glove, not even the heel. It hit off the side of his glove. It was not, it was just a fastball up and out of the strike zone. And I'm sure if that pitch would have missed, they would have walked McGriff intentionally after that. But 
things are just not going well for the Reds. You know, watch this pitch. It'll hit off the side of his glove. It really wasn't that high. There's a drive to left field. Way back. Chicago White Sox in August had one home run all season long and looks like he has put the cap on a four game sweep of the Cincinnati Reds by Atlanta. about the MCI proof positive replay Mike Devereaux with a bat that looks an awful lot like a broom that's going to help sweep the Cincinnati Reds out of the National League Championship Series. Three run shot off Mike Jackson. The Braves lead at five nothing. Our MCI proof positive replay Dave Burba has come on and he'll face Rafael Belliard. Two games in Cincinnati, both extra inning games. One by the Braves, two to one and six to two. Here last night, a tight game until Charlie O'Brien's three-run homer broke it open in the sixth inning. Huck foul back of the plate. Atlanta, an eventual five to two winner here last night. It was a one-nothing game until here in the bottom of the seventh inning. Keith Grissom led with a triple. Lemke popped out. Chipper Jones walked. A passed ball brought Grissom in from third. McGriff walked intentionally. Devereaux, the three run homer. Javi Lopez followed with a double. Cusco, the intentional walk. And now Belliard facing Dave Burma. 
slow roller. Lewis on the run, makes the throw, and the runners move up to second and third. So two out now, and Luis Polonia will come on to pinch hit for Greg McMichael. Nice play here by Lewis. I mean, he charges, throws on the run, and he gets Belliard. move up. Javi Lopez is at third. Klesko is at second and here's Polonia. Batting for Greg McMichael and Alejandro Pena is up and throwing in the Atlanta bullpen. hit in the ninth inning with two down in game three against the Colorado Rockies that tied the ball game for the Braves. They eventually lost, but it was a two-out clutch single that tied the ball game. The Braves went to the World Series in 1991 and were denied by the Minnesota Twins. Went again in 92 and were denied by the Toronto Blue Jays. clicks off there's really nothing that a manager can do about no that. with the well because I mean what can you do you can only try to hit and run more you tried and they didn't have opportunities to do that and you're right I mean when the team stops hitting there's not a lot you can do but you have to give the Reds starting pitching staff credit they held them close for each ball game including tonight until the late innings 2 2 pitch to Grissom in front of him makes the play and that'll do it. But the Reds come up with five in the bottom of the seventh. 
two innings to go. The Reds are down to six outs. Cincinnati trailing by six. Six outs remaining. Alejandro Pena is the new pitcher. And the Braves have been able to put together a real fine bullpen. They bought Pena in toward the end of this year for some veteran leadership, and he has really done a good job for them. Of course, McMi uh, McMichaels and the other guys have done a good job as well, but this was the last piece of the puzzle for their bullpen of some veteran leadership, and he's done a great job. Atlanta pitching coach Leo Mazzoni. The rocking, rocking Leo. There he goes. <laughs> It'll be Brett Boone, Mark Lewis, Eddie Taubenzi to face Pena. And perhaps the biggest thing to keep in mind is what you mentioned last inning, Joe. It'll be a well rested pitching staff. You're right, the Braves have. The Braves have everything has worked perfectly for them. I mean that is including the way they won the pennant the way they won the playoffs against the Rockies and now the way they beat they're beating the Reds. I mean everything has worked the way they would have it so that their pitching staff is aligned for the next series. Can you lose an edge with too much time off. Well I talked to some of the players and John talked to uh, Maddox. These guys feel like no their pitchers feel like you know, a little more rest is really going to make them that much stronger. Brett Boone. And again, I'm talking like it's over, but I'm, I'm still a believer in the Yogi Berra's theory. It's never over till it's over. I really believe that. Greg Maddox and John Smoltz. One ball, no strikes. Hit in the air. Back of second. Mark Lumpke for four now. Let's check on the ALCS once again. Hannah Storm. Hannah. The Indians looking to tie things up in the series, and they add another run against the Mariners in the bottom of the sixth. Omar Vizquel with a double off reliever Bobby Ayala. That scores Wayne Kirby from second base, and the Indians take a 7-0 lead as we're going to the seventh inning in this game. Back to you, Greg and Joe. All right, Hannah, thank you. Jeff Branson steps in now to hit for Mark Lewis and will no doubt go in to play third base. Swings and misses. Let's go down to Johnny Bench. John. Well, you know, the rest didn't seem to bother Greg Maddox. He hadn't pitched since Saturday. He said, I don't mind it. I was off 10 days during the, at one point during the season, I pitched my best game. Steve Avery, again tonight, had not pitched very much. He came in and just it was sterling with his performance. All right, John. You know, the layoff may affect some hitters a little bit more than with the pitchers. But when I talk to Leo Mazzoni, they have already decided how they will do it if they were able to win tonight. They will, you know, have they will use their normal routine and then they'll pitch the batters one time and be ready next Saturday. Oh, well, and Bobby Cox prior to the game wasn't willing to say that Greg Maddox would open the series for him, but I don't think there's much question. No, I, I think that Maddox will be the starter in the series, followed probably by Gladman and Smoltz. And maybe Avery has earned himself a shot. So you never know here. I mean, a lot of things have changed since this series began. 0 2 pitch. Outside, ball into the strike. Goes down swinging. The Reds. To four outs. Here's Ed Taubenzi who came on in the seventh inning behind the plate for Benito Santiago. And that passed ball really kind of opened the floodgates. Yes, it did. I, I think it made a big difference in the ball game. You may say, well, the guy hit a home run anyway. A lot of things happen differently when you're pitching in a different situation. But obviously that's not to blame Tobinzi for the fact that they're down here in the eighth inning. You're right because on the scoreboard that one run that Atlanta scored in the third inning still stands up as the game winner. And the way that.
that their relief pitchers have thrown, they could stand up probably for the next couple of days. A sellout crowd here at Fulton County Stadium. Came out to see their Braves sweep the Reds. Looks like they're going to get their win. Got a glove on it. Tough play. We'll get it. Chalk that up as an infield hit for Tobbins. Pena knocks it down, but if he would have let it go, Belliard would have been able to make the play. It wasn't hit that sharply, but because it was went off his glove they had no chance you could see Belliard in the background he was going to make the play and Pena not knocked it deflected it. and now Thomas Howard will come on to hit for Jerome Walton who struck out twice and bounced out to the pitcher in his three trips to the plate tonight and Howard will no doubt replace Walton in center field in the bottom half of the eighth inning. Inside ball one. Remember we talked about the Cincinnati Reds in their bullpen with a 9.00 earned run average. The Braves have just gone the opposite direction. And that is, has been the difference in the series. I mean, the Braves scored runs in extra innings in Cincinnati where the Reds were not able to do that off of their bullpen. One run that the Atlanta bullpen allowed was a ninth inning run. That made the score 5 2 instead of 5 1 last night. And the Atlanta bullpen getting ready. Mark Willard. 2 0 the count to Thomas Howard. 2 1. Well, the Reds are where they want to be in their lineup. But their lineup isn't getting the hits. Left center field. Grissom makes the catch. The Reds are down to three outs. Six nothing Atlanta. Punt. For the bottom of the eighth inning and a couple of defensive changes for the Cincinnati Reds. That's Jeff Branson, the new third baseman. He replaces Mark Lewis and Thomas Howard for Jerome Walton in center field. The Brave will send Lemke, Chipper Jones, Fred McGriff to face Dave Burba. And while we have the opportunity, as we wind down this National League Championship Series, our thanks and all due credit to our crew headed by executive producer of NBC Sports Tommy Roy coordinating producer of the baseball network John J. Filippelli coordinating producer for NBC Sports is John Gonzalez Larkin at short and one out the vice president of operations for the baseball network is Ed Delaney studio producers Lance Garrett Bill Graff and Sam Flood and the studio director Rick Piva Tonight's game, produced by Mark Wolf and directed by Ken Fouts, our associate producer John Vassallo, technical director Mary Reedinger, our production assistant Eric Posman, Steve Hurt, our director of information. This one hit down the left field line, turning foul, and goes into the stand. Our operations manager, Suzanne Turner, Paul Newman, our statistician, thank you one and all. Is that the Paul Newman? That's one of them. Oh, one of them. Okay. So the Reds looking at starting all over again next season. After a season of promise ends in a four-game sweep here in Atlanta. They are down to their last three outs. I guess the question would be, where do you start building? I think you have to start probably with their bullpen because their star is a pitch pretty, pretty well as general manager Jim Bowden of the Reds 
who has done a fine job with the Reds. Yes, he has. And, and like any other team that is offensive minded, you can always use one more bat in the lineup. And I would think that bat would be preferably would be left handed. Chipper Jones on base three times tonight with a single and a pair of walks. Two balls, two strikes. Inside, the count is full. And Chipper Jones walks for the third straight time. That man McGriff, and what a league championship series he has had. Hitting 467 as he steps to the plate on seven out of 15. Five runs scored, four doubles, three walks. And he has always been in the mix. He has always been there when the Braves mounted an attack. Ball one. What you're saying is he's a factor even when he's standing he in the on deck circle. Exactly. He is the guy that makes this team go offensively, in my opinion. 2 0. This was expected to be a very competitive series. In the double play ball to second for one relay doesn't get McGriff. Nice play by Brett Boone, however. Chipper Jones stopped in the baseline. He turned and got the force at second. Good play by both Chipper Jones and Brett Boone. Boone did the proper thing, charged it, charged it. He wanted to be able to tag Jones as he went by, but Jones stopped. Here's Mike Devereaux. of a three run homer back in the seventh inning. He turned a two nothing game into a five nothing game. Strike one. find interesting is how the Braves if they are able to hold on to this lead how they play the first couple of games of the World Series because they're under a lot of pressure they've been able to do everything but win a World Series we'll see if they're as relaxed in the World Series as they have been in these first two playoff series good stop by Tobinzi there the ball and two strikes they have made the point that this season is not going to be considered a success unless they will win the world championship. That's putting a lot of pressure on yourself because I think it has been a success. But they're of the state of mind that nothing is good enough unless we win the world championship because we've never won one. So we'll, that'll be interesting to see how much pressure they have actually put on themselves when the World Series starts next week if they're able to hold on to this lead. One two pitch. First. We've played eight. The Reds have three outs left in their season. You who've been watching Cleveland and Seattle, we welcome you along with our viewers to Fulton County Stadium in Atlanta. Six nothing Atlanta as we go to the top of the ninth, and Davey Johnson looking at his last moments as the manager of the Cincinnati Reds. He will be gone once the Reds season winds down. Mark Wallers has come on. Here in the ninth inning for Atlanta, he will face Barry Larkin, Ron Gant, and Reggie Sanders as the Braves try to close out the Reds in four games. And it's kind of ironic that these are the three hitters that he has to face. Larkin, Gant, and Sanders, the ones who are counted on to carry the Reds through the
this series, and it just has not happened that way. Barry Larkin sporting a 412 average, but it's been Gant and Sanders who have come up woefully shy in the power department. One and one. But even if you look at the numbers for Larkin, he has gotten on base himself with a couple of infield hits, but he has not hit with runners in scoring position. He has left runners. He has not driven in a run in this series either. So the three big guys in the middle just have not been able to produce. Started for Atlanta tonight, gave the Braves six strong innings. Bobby Cox says, I'll take that. And of course, Pete Short started for the Reds, and he pitched very, very well. So the starters in this entire series have pitched well for both teams. It has been the, the difference has been the bullpen. Jammed him, and he fouls it back. Steve Avery stands to get the victory here tonight. And the Braves content to sit back and let the Mariners and the Indians fight it out. And then we'll start the World Series with a well rested pitching staff. Cincinnati Reds stand to set a record you don't want to lay claim to. Just five runs scored in the National League Championship Series. Only last night did they score more than one run in any of the games. They scored two. 0-2. Just a buck 15 with runners on base.
masterful performance in the National League Championship Series. A three-hit shutout of the Cincinnati Reds here. The Reds averaging five runs a game during the regular season. Scored one, two, two, and none. chance to come over here late in the season uh, it was a dream in itself knowing we're going to the divisional championship and to be where I am today is just unbelievable I mean it's, it's great we have one more hurdle to, to cross now and uh, hopefully uh, we'll do as best we can and uh, get that one taken care of also it's a nice it's a nice town going to the World Series isn't it oh man I uh, never even dreamed of it see everybody can do it Greg and of course tonight it was Mike Devereaux and the league championship most valuable player congratulations thank you very much sir. John Mike Devereaux having an unusual as Johnny said unusual injury to, to Dave Justice here's the final out and I guess it's only fitting he started swinging at the high fastball and he finishes the series swinging at that high fastball and becoming a strikeout victim just great pitching here from the Atlanta Braves and you can't say anything other than that they have a dominant pitching staff. Mark Wallers and the Reds celebrating out on the field. The Braves sweep Cincinnati by a score of six to nothing. Steve Avery the winner, Pete Shorick the loser. For Joe Morgan and Johnny Bench, I'm Greg Gumbel. Let's send you to Bob Costas and Bob Euchre at Jacobs Field.